Imagine being sick for over three decades with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, MECFS, multiple chemical sensitivities, and chronic Lyme disease. Imagine being closely connected to the advocacy world, being an advocacy leader, and being up to date with the research. When suddenly you come across somebody talking about recovery. Recovery? What's that, you say? Never heard of it. Now imagine making a full recovery, but imagine doing it unusually quickly in just three months. Well, I'm excited to bring to you this interview with Claudia, which was recorded six months after she recovered. And at the time of publishing now, she has actually been well for over a year. You can probably appreciate that this would be quite a whirlwind experience. And given her vast experience with the illness and the advocacy world, Claudia has a lot to say, and she has a lot of wisdom to impart. So to make it easier, I've actually broken this interview into a number of parts so that you can enjoy them in, in bite-sized chunks. Now, please don't make the mistake of skipping ahead to find that magic cure. The wisdom and the lessons are throughout the whole interview. It's about understanding how Claudia made that shift in paradigm. Now, Claudia actually used the ANS Rewire program, but what is key here is understanding how she came to use it so effectively. And she shares a lot of insights in this interview. For people in the program, there's also an additional portion that is published inside the insights sections. So make sure you watch that. You might also like to listen to the testimonial for ANS Rewire that Claudia recorded where she shares her thoughts on what made her experience such a success. So get comfortable and enjoy this wonderful interview with this amazing lady who really understands the recovery process. You can binge watch it or you can enjoy it in small chunks. It's totally up to you. I look forward to your comments as usual. Today, I'm here with Claudia from the US. Uh, hi, Claudia. How are you doing? Hi, Dan. I'm doing great. Yeah, that's not a loaded question there. Yeah? Um, yeah, yes. <laughs> Whereabouts in the US are you? I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix, Arizona. Fantastic. So the Southwest. Yeah. yeah. And um, look, uh, you recovered from uh, uh, CFS and fibromyalgia. You were in the program. Uh, and you recovered about six months ago, um, yes. but you were actually ill uh, a long time and, and involved in advocacy as well. Um, can you tell us how, lo how long ago it was that you first got ill? I became ill in uh, 19, uh, 1985, 1985. So over 30 years ago. Yeah. yeah, 33 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And I guess before you got ill, you were always a healthy person? Yeah, pretty much. I, I had a thyroid issue as a child, but other than that, I was a very healthy person. Okay. Yeah. A and um, and so what, what happened? How did you know that something was wrong? What were your first symptoms? Uh, I would start by saying I was under a lot of stress at that time. I was 25 and I was recently divorced with a child. Um, didn't have any education or resources, so a lot of stress. Um, and I got sick. I got a case of uh, herpes simplex and then two viruses all in the same few months I would say um, right. bacterial viral I don't know what they were but I was just really floored with sickness oh, goodness. Uh, that was the start of progression um, that was when I began to know that something was wrong I was not returning to my old self right yeah must have been very tough you know being a single mom and and then being ill um, it, it, yeah what, what happened? I, you, you, you went to the doctor and, and what did they say? Um, at that point, I, you know, I was young, I was 25, so I attributed it to stress mostly. Um, when I had some real hardcore symptoms, I would go to the doctor and try to figure it out, but nothing really ever came of it. Right. So I, I would say mainly at that time, I just kept pushing. Yeah. Um, I, uh, um, I was really pushing too. I, I ended up going to college and graduate school and working and I had um, my husband now, I was dating him. So it's a very active, kind of stressful, fast-paced lifestyle. Right. So um, 
uh, but I did start at that time trying to figure out what was going on. So the investigation began in 1985, and really nothing was uncovered for over 20 years. 20 years. That's when you yeah. got diagnosed, is that right? I was diagnosed in 2005. Wow. But um, because at that point I completely crashed. Right. I could no longer even get through a shower to get ready to go to work in the morning. Yeah. Um, I was sitting on the floor in the shower and holding my hair dryer up with my you know hand because I couldn't I couldn't even get ready. Yeah. Um, so yeah, things came crashing down at that point. Um, I don't know why. Uh, nothing had happened. Nothing that yeah. nothing different. No. Um, Just years no. of illness. Yeah. 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 Well, the job I was in was extremely stressful. I would have to say yeah. I had been an audiologist. A clinical right. audiologist for many years, and I thought that was what was causing my problems. Mm. So I left that field, and I went into pharmaceuticals, which mm. was horribly stressful. Mm. Um, I was traveling a lot uh, with a, you know my car, mm. and uh, it was a very very stressful job. Mm. So I think that stress was probably what caused me to have that great crash at that yeah. time. Well, it was I, I think and emotional it... stress. Anyone who's got CFS or fibromyalgia will know that as soon as we place too many demands on ourselves, um, we tend to have flare-ups, don't we? Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, that, that makes things very, very difficult. Uh, goodness, that's yeah. so long to get diagnosed. And, and, and uh, you know, I mean, um, what kind of, uh, what led to the diagnosis? I mean, obviously you were so severely ill, but I mean, I guess you had the fatigue and you had pain. Uh, you got diagnosed with CFS and fibromyalgia? Yeah, so I was diagnosed by a rheumatologist um, eventually. I think I counted. I saw 22 specialists in that period of time. Yeah. And uh, no one, I mean, there were, some people were indicating that it might be CFS, but yeah. she actually diagnosed it. Okay. Um, I had extreme pain every day all over my body. Uh, I had migraines. I had cognitive issues were severe at that point. I, I was trying to drive to doctor's offices that I would call on and I couldn't remember how to get to them. I had to pull over and this was before cell phone navigation so I had no idea where I was. Um, I couldn't remember words. I was losing language capability. I was, um, my short term memory was gone. Uh, so it was a lot of hard neurological symptoms that were very scary. Mm. Uh, and then of course the physical pain and uh, lots of digestive issues. Uh, I was diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome at that time. Um, so yeah, the exhaustion was just so much. It was overwhelming, and uh, it just it, at that point I couldn't get out of bed. Mm. So mm. I was forced to leave my job, and in the process of trying to get the short-term, long-term disability with my job, they required a diagnosis. And yes. so I was really pushing to try to get a diagnosis. And yes. uh, I had a lovely doctor at the time who also had a chronic illness. So she understood and, and did the best she could to diagnose, uh, to fill out paperwork and, and mm. get to the bottom of what was going on. Mm. So, um, and yeah. uh, did you have a lot of other symptoms like sensitivity to sounds uh, or lights? Um, uh, all I, the... Yeah, when I had migraines, I had extreme sensitivity to light. Mm -hmm. I um, I pretty much always had a sensitivity to loud sounds. Right. Uh, I also noticed that if I was scared suddenly, like my husband used to like to, to pull pranks where he would just say boo, mm -hmm. I could feel surges of adrenaline yeah. shooting down my arms. Yes. And that was, and so I knew something was really not right yeah. with my nervous system, I could just tell. What, what, what about sleep, sleep issues? Yeah. My sleep was terrible. I went for a sleep study at a university and they said that I had a sleep problem, but it was not apnea. It was that I had no no deep sleep whatsoever. Mm. So my cells were not recovering during my sleep. Mm. Mm. So yeah, that was an issue. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, I mean, uh, we, we, we spoke before and you mentioned quite a, lo a lot of symptoms. I mean, you, even had, you also had chemical sensitivities, is that right? I did. I really didn't tolerate any kind of medications. Um, yeah. I, I didn't tolerate smells. A lot of smells were just draw. I would I would get a migraine literally from smells. Yeah. Uh, if I walked through Home Depot, I, I had to get through it really quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pesticide smells, perfumes, um, 
alcohol, I couldn't tolerate alcohol at all. Yes. Uh, one sip and I would feel a migraine coming on. Yeah. Yeah. And did you find that you got run down a lot, like, and you'd be susceptible to catching flus and, and colds <laughs> and all that? You know, interestingly, I did not. I didn't get any kind of flu or cold or normal sickness mm -hmm. throughout at least that last 13 years. Wow. wow. Um, it, yeah, it was the strangest thing. I would say I'm the healthiest sick person I know. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I guess you, you probably over the 20 years of illness probably learned how to take care of yourself very well, given how vulnerable you are. Maybe it was a lack of exposure. I wasn't around children. I, my daughter was grown. Um, I really didn't socialize that much, but yeah. um, okay. I always thought it was my immune system was not properly responding anymore. Right, right. It wasn't doing its job. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, no, um, I, I, I totally... So my, my relapses were more in the form of okay. exhaustion and you know a little bit of a fever feeling and uh, that sort of pain, lots of pain. I'm just thinking you had all these symptoms and they were obviously severe. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, uh, you know, you had to even stop working, and when you were working, you were struggling. Um, um, I mean, you know, what did the doctor say? If they didn't diagnose you with CFS and fibromyalgia, I mean, like, what, what's you know. I, I got a laundry list of diagnoses. I, I got endometriosis. I got migraine. I got possible depression, which I did not have. Um, uh, something called hypogamma globulinemia, which is an autoimmune disorder uh, involving the globulins. Um, um, something to do with elevated bilirubin. I mean, they would pick and choose all these other little mm. things that were uh, obviously abnormal within the system, but they never put the whole package together uh, until this mm. final, you know, this finally, this doctor said, yes, it's, it's CFS and fibromyalgia. Mm. So I had, uh, you know, many, many different diagnoses. Um, mm. So I felt like I was chasing all these things around, mm. uh, but couldn't find a common element for any of them. Uh, did you say you were also diagnosed with chronic Lyme? Yes, chronic, okay. uh, uh, untreated Lyme. Uh, so yeah. in in the late 1990s, I was living in Dallas, Texas, and I was helping build mountain bike trail and uh, was bit by a tick. And at that time, I didn't understand that ticks carry disease, so I didn't go get checked up. Um, but uh, later in 2012, there was a Lyme specialist, she was a neurosurgeon actually, who practiced holistic medicine, who moved into my town at the time, Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I went to see her and she diagnosed me chronic Lyme and right. treated me for that and also for heavy metals. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. were they able to confirm that the uh, that the Lyme infection was gone at the end of the treatment? Yeah, she retested yeah. and it was gone. The heavy metals were difficult. Uh, yeah. I, the lead, I had a very difficult yeah. time getting rid of the lead. And you know, people think that it's pokey yeah. to test for the uh, heavy metals, but um, one of the metals that showed high was gadolinium. And I had gone for an uh, MRI with contrast and they had used gadolinium. Uh, and they told me that the half-life of it was very short and that it should have been out of my system a month before the test. So when I went for the test, it was extremely high. Right. So that was, to me, you know, some support that, okay, this test, although it may not be absolute levels, it gives me an idea of the trending. Yeah. So I could see that, yes, there's, you know, mercury, lead, gadolinium, you know, all these calcium are really high, and now they're really low or gone. Yes. Um, Yes. And then once she cleared those with nutrition and herbs and so forth, then she addressed the line um, because she explained to me that the, the heavy metals form a sheath around the Lyme disease in the brain mm. so that it causes it to be stealthy. It's mm. the, the immune system can't even see that the Lyme disease is actually there. Mm. Uh, and, so and, what, never, and what was the treatment for the Lyme? It was also an herbal protocol. It's called Byron White. Mm -hmm. um, and she... Okay chose which ones I should do and how yeah. often and, and how long were you doing that extremely low doses ah, okay. I did it for three years okay. it's a long protocol okay. and it involved nutritional changes I was at that time I went gluten dairy sugar and alcohol free yeah um, I drank only reverse osmosis water uh, right. she had me doing these funky green drinks you know with kale okay. and ginger and how did you feel at the end of all that 
much better. My yeah. brain brain clarity was definitely improved. Yeah. Uh, my energy levels were better. Uh, yeah. I would say at that point I was operating at sixty percent of where I had been yeah. prior to becoming sick. Right. But so it was still, a huge improvement, but not enough. Improvement, but still all the symptoms. Yes, all the symptoms were still there. Yeah. And, um, and and the setbacks when you do, did anything. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, took out the Lyme, kept the chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And a few other diagnoses that you had exactly. uh, as long as list your arm. I think one of those, did you say one of the diagnoses was also for Hashimoto's? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And um, so um, is that something that you still would say you have? Uh, I don't think I have Hashimoto's anymore. I, I, I still take thyroid medication at this point. Mm -hmm. um, my, in my adolescence, it started as hypothyroidism and then later changed to Hashimoto's. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I have Hashimoto's because that's when it, you know, flip flops, uh, it doesn't do that anymore. Right. Um, it's okay. stable normal. Um, I don't know what would happen. I still take the medication. If I stopped, I don't know at this point. And, mm. and it's possible that I don't have it anymore. Yeah, no, interesting. Yeah. And we'll talk yeah. about that a little bit later. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, what would you say having CFS and fibro was like at its worst? I mean, is there a moment? I mean, you mentioned that, that moment in the shell. Would you say that was your low point? Or was there another Definitely. point? That was the lowest point for me. I, I was bottomed out. I had nothing left. Um, I I was so afraid because, you know, at, at first I was afraid because I didn't have a diagnosis. Then I was afraid because I had a diagnosis and basically she said, you have these two things and there's nothing I can do that's more than what you're already doing. Go mm -hmm. home and keep doing what you're doing. Um, that was so scary. Yeah. Um, you know, and trying to navigate through the medical system. Thankfully, I had my experience in the pharmaceutical and audiology fields because that helped me have the knowledge and skills to navigate with physicians. I knew mm. how to talk to them. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's a scary place to find yourself with a chronic disease and having no one help you. And, 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 and you know, navigating. In, yeah. Incurable in, chronic disease, you, you're told, yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and not knowing what that means for your future, and uh, you know your spouse is looking at you like, what What did the doctor say? What are they going to do for you? Because that's the natural response. You get sick, the doctors tell you what to do, and um, mm. that is not the case. So mm. you're you're just left floating in this terrible place. I mean, twenty, really thirty years, right? Yeah, yeah. Thirty three years. I mean, how are you getting by with your life? I mean, did you even know what normal was? Did you even know how <laughs> sick you were? I mean, no. you know, it must, you know, how did it impact your life? Uh, I think it must be hard for people to understand what it's like to yeah. be sick for three decades. Yeah, it's hard for me to even wrap my brain around it because I would say that outwardly I'm a very optimistic, very positive. I've been called Pollyanna. You know, I'm just that kind of person. I always try to look at the bright side of things. Yes. Um, but on the inside, I was sad. I was so broken. Um, I I tried not to go there to that dark place because it was not helping. It was not a place you can cope with it very easily, is it? Right. No. So you just and don't even want to think about that stuff because no. you just can't. You, you can't, can't afford there. it because you you're too ill. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, and I've always been a helper. I mean, it, you can see that from my fields of choice. I, I was an audiologist. I liked helping people. So for me to be the person on the other end was extremely uncomfortable. Um, I wanted to be helping. So I think that's why I found mm. going into advocacy a natural fit. Because yeah. I felt like no one should have to go through what I went through in terms of getting a diagnosis and then feeling so isolated and having not known what to do or where to turn and um, yes. The responses from, from other people in society were awful sometimes. I, in fact, the caseworker for the company I worked for, a top five pharmaceutical company, she said to me one day, you know, if you had cancer, this would be a lot easier. Mm. I mean, I, I, I don't even know what to do with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just uh, terrible. 
I, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> yeah, I have no response myself. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I'm just I'm waiting right, for you yeah, to take, right. take the conversation forward because I'm feeling a bit stuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So people yeah. don't know what to do with you, I guess, is the point I'm making. People in society yeah. don't know what to say or do because yeah. they're used to, you get sick, you get fixed. It's, this, this, whatever this NECFS fibromyalgia world is, is so unknown to people. Yeah. It's terrible. So, 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 so it took you twenty years to be diagnosed, right? Yeah. And yeah. then, so then you were off work now for like thirteen years. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I, All that education <laughs> that I spent so much energy on and and money and, and yes. time, you know, um, yeah, no work and. Um, I mean, uh, it, how, it, you're just doing your advocacy work in in the CFS fibro community and. And what 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 what's your average day like? I mean, how does how does life look after yeah. twenty years? <laughs> yeah. So I would also say I'm a doer. I'm yeah. not a I'm not a person who likes to just be. Yeah. Um, which is good and bad because I learned through the disease and recovery process that just being is actually healthy. Mm. Um, but doing was my thing, and so I. I think I got into advocacy because I was looking for help for myself, but through it, I realized I could help others. And so I took on that role. Um, I created actually a 24 hour mountain bike race that was a benefit to the CFIDS Association. Um, and I ran that for three years. Wonderful. So wow. um, it was really success successful and, and I was very proud of achieving that even though I was sick. Um, but, um, I what? got to a point where I had to step away from that. Yeah, um, I was going to say. I mean, what toll did that take on you physically? A lot, because you know, even though it was a one weekend a year, it took a full year to plan. Yeah, it was quite a lot of work, and um, but out of that came the Facebook group that I utilized for my advocacy. So I kept running that from 2007 until 2018. Wow! So that how, was how what big I was that group? It was thousands of people, yeah. so it was a big group. Um, yeah. I also served on a, a couple of platforms. I um, was on a U.S. working group to the CDC for MECFS and participated in the Pathways to um, Prevention, the P2P meeting for MECFS at the NIH. And, uh, for the they, they created the Institute of Medicine report about the disease yes, that's in 2015. Right. So yes. I was pretty involved in all of that. Um, I participated in some FDA meetings, patient centered right. stuff. Um, so I was pretty involved yeah. with that on yeah. a daily basis. So that kept me busy. I also became an artist during yes. the time that I was sick. Um, yeah. yeah, that was a, a, a beautiful coincidence. Yes. Um, um, and, and actually very therapeutic. Um, I, I, it's difficult to become a triathlete whilst we have CFS fibromyalgia, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> yeah. So I could see how uh, it would have been a wonderful fit to give you some kind of an outlet and, and I guess, help you keep some semblance of happiness because, like yes. you said, you felt very sad inside and you've been robbed oh, yeah. so much and you can't work and you can't participate yeah. with your family and all this kind of thing. So, yeah, um, yeah I mean, what a great, great way to have an, uh, an outlet. I mean, yeah, it sounded like I was perhaps putting some words in your mouth there from from our previous conversation. But can, can you tell us what? How did it affect your relationships and and with your family and and, and friends? So, for my husband and I, it was a huge impact because we actually started mountain biking together in 1985, 86. So our entire life was surrounded with physical activity. I was not an athlete as a kid. It wasn't until I met him that I started doing athletic activities. And so we, you know, we were on tennis leagues and softball leagues and we played volleyball and skied and had all this very active lifestyle and, and hiked and biked and traveled a lot. And uh, my daughter does all of those things too. So, you know, most of my family activities were physical. Mm. Uh, all of my friends are athletes. So I felt so um, isolated and, and jealous, very jealous. Um, I tried going to events and 
participating as a spectator and I just I was so filled with bitterness I couldn't even go anymore mm. um, I it's a slap in the face isn't it oh yeah it let's celebrate your amazing yeah. achievement whilst I can't do anything ever yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, whilst I get to sit here on the sidelines for the last 30 years yeah Hard to keep and, cheering you know, people even, on you know I have to say even my husband didn't quite grasp the severe nature of the impact that it had on my on me um, yeah. we had conversations about that early on and and I said I don't I don't think you understand what it's like to lose the ability to do what you truly love to do and uh, he said well no if it happened to me I would just find something else that I love to do and I thought wow well, you know the words flow out so easily but it's try, try living a, it it's such a difficult path to take with yeah. grace yeah and, and I tried to take it with grace yeah well, I think it sounded like you did uh, fairly well, uh, yeah. but there's a limit to what any human can do, isn't there? Yeah. And and, and it appears that with MEC, Vest and Farbo, uh, we love uh, exploring those limits because just about <laughs> everyone I speak to, whether they've recovered or still ill with it, um, I find themselves yeah. inspirational, uh, you know, including the people who haven't recovered, you know, the people who are ill with it. Oh, yeah. It's like they inspire me. I mean, how they just manage it, you know, um, and... Um, yeah. Because maybe when I reflect on my own years, many years of illness, not not compared to you, but you know, uh, yeah. you know, the it's best years of my life, one might say, seven yeah. years of illness in my thirties. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I I don't think I did such a good job coping with it at all. Uh, you know, uh, especially as the years go on, you know, and then we go through these crazy cycles. Look, uh, you mentioned your your treatments, uh, some of your treatments. I mean. You know, obviously, you come across a lot of ideas, a lot of theories. You're in the advocacy world. You're in the research. You know, not not as a researcher, but you're connected to seeing a lot of research uh, with your advocacy work. You must have tried a lot of treatments over the years. Uh, I, I mean, tried <laughs> so many things. I tried so many things. And in fact, you part of the answer to this it goes back to your prior question about what was my daily life like. Some of the coping me mechanisms that I tried to initiate helped me, I think, cope, but also helped me um, stay at a certain level with the disease as well. So some things that I did were, you know, art, obviously, I learned to do art. That was something that activated my brain, but also my spirit. Uh, I also learned to play a uh, musical instrument on my own, because I thought that that was important for my brain. Mm. Um, I couldn't do it very often, and I was terrible at it, but it was good stimulation for the brain, and I knew intuitively that I needed that. Uh, I did word puzzles. They were so, so difficult, but I did them. And so I feel like all of those little things were helpful to me. To give you some sort of semblance of still doing as opposed yes. to just staring at a wall feeling sick. I was so afraid of atrophy, physical and mental atrophy, that I... I wanted to keep doing things. Th mm. Those things, plus I, I still did a lot of physical activity that most people with the disease can't do, mm. um, but I didn't do them well and I didn't recover from them well, so I would never recommend that. Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, I probably was causing more harm than good, but I I just had this fear that if I stopped moving, I would die. Mm. It was just, that's just how I felt. Mm. Um, did you try a lot I, of different sort of treatment protocols or yeah I yeah. mean you, you must have seen a, a few doctors in those years I tried lots of different supplements whatever people would tell me try this try that I tried I did herbal protocols I did um, chiropractics physical therapy acupuncture um, yoga Tai Chi Qigong um, uh, I tried steroids once or twice, just low doses of them. Um, I think of what else I did. Uh, movement. I, I always moved. So walking, yeah. you know, yoga, stretching, whatever. Uh, did the doctors try and come up with like different medications and things like that? Did you stay connected to a doctor over the years, or did, I did. you? I always yeah. did. But, yeah. but they really didn't have anything for me. Um, yeah. they, they suggested antivirals uh, for herpes simplex, but you know, you all, I only did that for treatment when I had a flare-up. But um, mm. 
those just mm. make me feel awful anyway. Um, mm. No. So I, what do you what are you thinking at this stage? I mean, it's like thirty years. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I imagine you weren't really. I shouldn't say it. I mean, were you expecting to recover again one day? Did you no, think? No. But when did you give up on the possibility of recovering your health? Um, probably because I was so involved in advocacy and I saw the research coming through, I just didn't ever feel like anything. Okay, my this is what I felt like. I felt like there was a wheel to recovery. I felt like the the research that's out there, especially now, there's some really good research right now. They were the